All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to make a start. There are six parallel sessions going on uh, right now, as you may know. You have chosen the best one. So congratulations. Um, this is entitled Behavioural Scientists of the Future. It's not so long ago that, uh, that behavioural scientists were regarded uh, as sort of heretics, charlatans, or um, simply delusional. Today, they are showered with titles and awards, or at least some of them are. Uh, I remember interviewing Daniel Kahneman, probably uh, just over 10 years ago now, uh, at his home, uh, and I asked to see his Nobel Prize. Kahneman smiled and, uh, and agreed and uh, searched through his cabinets, opened a drawer. Nobel Prize wasn't there. He opened a cabinet. It wasn't in there. He looked through some more drawers. And I could see him getting more and more agitated as he searched to show me his Nobel Prize. Eventually, after increasingly frantic rummaging around his, uh, his flat, uh, his agony turned to joyful relief. As the, uh, as the Nobel Prize was indeed located in the very first drawer that he'd opened at the back. Um, although the professor never quite recovered his composure. Um, and since the medal had been awarded for a psychological paper demonstrating how people hate loss more than they value gain, it was uh, perhaps an apt moment. For those who follow in the footsteps of uh, such great academics, there is, I think, a real opportunity to build on the work of the pioneers right now. Technology has revolutionized the way in which research can be conducted, and governments and other organizations need much less persuasion than they once did of the value of behavioral insights. So this session is an opportunity to, to meet and to celebrate uh, people from that new generation of behavioral scientists who've already made waves with their work. The four individuals uh, you're going to be meeting here this afternoon have been chosen in a competition as representatives for some of the most exciting work that's going on. So let me explain how that's me at the top. So we're going to be hearing from uh, Philip, from Jana, from Hengchen, and from Ashley, and then Michael Sanders from BIT will sort of pull the whole session together. Each of the uh, four uh, young behavioral scientists uh, will present to you for 15 minutes, uh, after which we will have five minutes of intense grilling, partly from me, but hopefully also from uh, you. Uh, and, um, and one of them, uh, it should be said, uh, has actually won uh, an award in the um, uh, BX 2015 awards, which are being... Um, are being revealed uh, later this afternoon. So, um, you know, you, you can try and see, work out who you think should have been the winner of that. Okay, we're going to, we're going to kick off. Um, I'm going to invite our first, uh, first of our, vi oh, no, I was going to say victims, no, that's not right, is it? First of our uh, uh, aspiring behavioral scientists to come and address you, and that's Philip Newell from the University of Stirling. Philip, if you want to come up with your 15 minutes. Thank you very much indeed. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the dark side of behavioral science. Um, so I'm gonna be looking at gambling advertising in the UK. Uh, my central thesis is that uh, gambling advertising is a nudge, but it's a nudge that makes people strictly worse off. Um, so I'm gonna be looking at gambling advertising um, for soccer slash football. Um, now if you watch, if you watch a soccer match in the UK you're, on TV, you're gonna see an awful lot of gambling advertising. Um, also, specifically, what I'll be talking about is you'll see advertising that is mentioning the odds on specific events uh, for that match. So not only will you see an ad from a bookie saying, hey, come bet with us, but they'll do an ad saying, hey, come bet with us. You can try this sp specific bet. Here are the odds on it. And um, since bookies have hundreds of different like, bets that you can make in a single match, the bookies have got to select from that selection of a hund hundreds one or two to advertise to you on TV. And so how do they select which bets to advertise to you? My argument is they use kind of classic behavioral science principles, um, but in the kind of reverse way to how we normally um, kind of hear about them. Um, so my study, um, my study is a kind of observational study of gambling advertising over um, the 2014 World Cup. Um, so I've got a total of over 400 betting adverts from six different bookies, which is essentially almost the entire like, kind of gambling industry in the UK. Um, these are adverts from TV, 
from shop windows and from also within bookies themselves. And so I got a total of over 100 TV adverts that were shown over the 64 um, kind of World Cup matches last summer. Uh, now, given that half the World Cup matches were on the BBC, which doesn't show adverts, um, this means there's like somewhat over like three um, kind of live odds betting adverts per soccer match last year. Um, so here on the right of the screen, I've got two examples of um, kind of TV betting ads. The top one from Bet365, Ben Techie's a certain player, and they're giving the odds for him to score the next goal. And the one below that is um, one from Labrooks that's kind of similar. Um, they're showing you the odds on a player, Olivier Giroud, to score the first goal. Um, so what are the two things that determine um, whether a bookie will advertise a certain bet? The two things are complexity and representativeness. So the more complex they kind of make a certain bet, the harder it is for you to make a normative probability judgment. And then if they add representativeness to this, like if they choose like a salient event from a category, then this um, kind of makes it even more kind of appealing or falsely so. Um, so the study I did was in the uh, World Cup last summer. However, these two adverts were from the um, Arsenal-Liverpool game a couple of weeks ago, and they actually fit the exact same pattern that I found last summer. So it's very much not an artifact of um, like when I did the study, and it's something that's very much going on. It's something you can confirm for yourself if you decide to watch, watch a football match. Um, so the kind of uh, the um, principles that they use are what I call like a dark nudge. So it uses kind of classic um, nudge principles but it then reverses them. So in nudge, you're tradi traditionally in nudge, you, you should make things simple. Well, in dark nudges, you do the opposite. You make things complex. Um, so here I've got uh, examples of four different bet types that I um, got over the last summer. So the simplest bet type is betting on a certain team to win, so Germany to win. This is what I call a match winner bet. Now this, um, these are the simplest bet types because um, um, there are only like a few things that can happen. Like, if you're betting on a team to win the match, then either team A can win the match, team B can win the match, or can be a draw. So this isn't a complex bet type, and actually these match winner bets hardly featured in the advertising that I found. Scoreline bets um, are kind of much better for the bookie. They're more complex because, say, a bet like Germany to win 3-1, there are many different scorelines that can happen. Um, it's the same thing with first goal scorer bets, so like Thomas Muller to score the first goal. There were 20 outfield players in a soccer match who could all score the first goal. Um, so if you're making a normative probability judgment of this, you have to compare the likelihood of 20 different players all scoring the first goal, and this is something that's quite hard to do. And then the most complex bet type that I got are things called scorecaster bets. These are bets on um, a team, a specific scoreline and a player to score the first goal. And so if you think about it, you know, you've got like, say, 20 different potential scorers, say 20 different potential scorelines. There's a hell of a lot of information that you'd have to like accurately compute. Uh, to make a normative judgment of this. And now the second thing um, that they use is they, um, want it, they want it to be hard for consumers to directly compare prices. So for example, if you want to bet on like, a team to win the match, then you can easily compare like, the odds that different bookies have. However, um, it's much harder for, like, for the other bet types, so say like the scoreline bets. Bookie A could advertise Germany to win 3-1, Bookie B could advertise Germany to win 3-0, and they don't have to like, come directly um, in competition with one another. Um, so the first uh, kind of uh, psychological theory that they can use in trying to nudge you in bad ways is um, support theory from Tversky and Kohler. Uh, this says that um, the sum of probability estimates um, increases as a class of events is unpacked into its logical constituent elements. So an example from their paper is that when asked to estimate the probability of death from heart disease, cancer or other natural causes, then people will give like a higher probability estimate for this group than if asked to estimate the probability of death from natural causes, even though the two groups are logically equal. And if you're making a normative probability judgment, your estimated probability of the two should be exactly the same. Um, so an example from soccer betting um, would be comparing match winner bets to scoreline bets. Um, if you think about it, um, the, probability, the sum of probabilities of Germany to win 1-0, 2-0, 2-1, etc. should equal the probability that Germany will win um, from the match winner bet. However, um, support theory says that um, the more unpacked category will lead to like, higher probability judgments in total 
which will lead to people making less um, kind of normative probability judgments. And this is even though the two classes of events are uh, logically identical. Um, so how can you measure like how, bet, how bad a certain bet type is? Um, this is done uh, in gambling research using something called the overround. So the overround is how much the implied probabilities from a bookie's set of events for a complete set of events exceeds probability equal to one. So if the bets were completely fair, um, then their uh, odds should e add up to probability equal to one. So for example, um, if the probability of team A to win is 0.44, a probability of um, a draw is 0.31, and the probability of team B to win is 0.29, and this adds up to 1.04, which is slightly higher than 1, which means that the odds aren't completely fair. This equals an overround of 0 0.04, and from that you can work out the expected losses from this bet. So here um, I've got results from three different bookies over the 2014 World Cup for match winner bets, scoreline bets, and first goal scorer bets. And what you can see is the expected losses from different bet types varies to a huge degree, and, in, and it also um, supports the predictions of support theory. So you can see that the expected losses from match winner bets tend to actually be very low, like around like sort of four or five percent. Um, whereas scoreline bets, which are logically the same kind of events but unpacked to a great, greater deg degree, have expected losses of around like um, twenty percent on average. And uh, first goal scorer bets, which are you know like bets with twenty potential things that could happen, these have um, even higher average losses on average of around 0.3. Um, now, I don't have the data here for scorecaster bets, but they're going to have expected losses at least as high as their constituent elements. So you can see that just going from various different bet types can like, increase your expected losses by around an order of magnitude. Um, and yeah, by comparison, the kind of like expected losses on like, betting on roulette would vary between, say, 3 or 5%. So um, the fairest odds from the bookie is actually like, pretty decent. You get a pretty good deal if you bet on match winner bets. But if you're betting on scoreline bets or anything more exotic, you're going to lose like a lot of ma money on average. So what kind of bet types do they actually advertise? Um, here I've got the results for TV and shop window advertising across these different bet types that I found last summer. And uh, what I found is um, match winner bets, the kind of fairest, only kind of made up around 3% of the total advertising, uh, whereas scoreline, first goal scorer, and scorecaster bets Completely, almost completely dominated advertising. They were each like around 30% of advertising. So they're all, almost always advertising kind of very like um, unfair bets. Um, so how can they kind of make these unfair bets seem appealing to customers? Well, they can use the representativeness heuristic from Tversky and Kahneman. So this, is, uh, this says that we especially overestimate the probabilities of easily imaginable events. So for example, we're flipping a fair coin um, we'd, uh, you'd think it's more likely to get the uh, five flip sequence head, tails, heads, tails, tails than it is to flip five heads, even though the two sequences are exactly, um, have the same logical probability. Um, likewise, for kind of soccer betting, um, representativeness would lead to higher overestimation for like kind of events that you can imagine happening. So you can imagine like a good team like Germany to win by a high scoreline. Uh, but you can't, it's hard, much harder to imagine a bad team like Iran winning 4-0. Um, so basically the representativeness of a scoreline depends on like how good a team is. Um, the only representative scoreline there is for like a bad team to win would be like that team barely winning 1-0 or something. Uh, whereas the better the team gets, the easier it is to imagine that team winning by a high amount. Um, so likewise for like kind of first goal scorer bets, um, you can est it's easy to imagine like a good goal scorer scoring the first goal rather than a bad goal scorer. Um, okay, so here I have the results for first goal scorer and scoreline bets. These are these bets either shown in isolation or um, for a scorecaster bet, what I do is I split it up into its constituent scoreline bet and first goal scorer bet. So for the first goal scorer bets, I've got the probability of the player involved in the advert, th their probability of scoring the first goal minus the match average. So if bookies are kind of selecting random players randomly, and these should be centered around zero. However, what you can see for each of the different bookies is they're all choosing kind of um, players who are much more likely than average to score the first goal. So these are representative um, kind of potential first goal scorers. Uh, now for, which is like confirming that the bookies are kind of advertising representative events. 
Now for scoreline bets, um, I've got on the x-axis something called team strength. So this is the likelihood of the team to win the match as predicted from the bookies odds. And then I've got all data points um, by different scorelines that could happen. So I've got 1-0, then 2-1, which is the second most likely scoreline, then 2-0, then 3-0 plus. And you can see for 1-0, which is the most likely scoreline, that's kind of advertised with for relatively bad uh, teams on average. However, when the, team, when the score line becomes higher, um, those higher score lines are only advertised with um, kind of good, good teams. Um, so this kind of um, scatter plot where like the high score lines that get combined with good teams is kind of in line with what um, bookies advertising representative score lines would suggest. Um, so it's good always to rule out potential alternative explanations. So the first goal scorer bets are only valid if the player actually takes part in the match. So it could be the case that they're not adver advertising representative first goal scorers, but just people who are likely to take part in the match. Now, um, I've got a sample of half-time TV adverts where the bookies know exactly who's going to take part in the match. And there's actually no differences between this subsample and the su sample on average. So bookies advertise the same person, um, whether they know who's going to take part in the match or not. Um, so one, uh, so um, it seems to be the case that they're doing representativeness no matter what. Um, now, the second thing they could be trying to do is advertising bets of a certain risk-reward ratio. Um, here in this graph, I've got the decimal odds of all the different bets advertised. So these, the decimal odds shows the potential win from a one-pound bet if that bet um, kind of pays off. So you can see um, there are very large differences between the different uh, groups, the different types of bets. So first goal bets um, kind of have much lower decimal odds than the other bet types, which is indicating that they're not um, doing bets with target risk reward ratio. Um, they could make, for example, first goal scorer bets a lot, um, have much, much higher like potential payoffs, but that would involve not choosing representative scorers. Um, so this is kind of two potential alternative explanations that I've ruled out. Um, so, to conclude, um, bookies, and this is all bookies, have herded on a common strategy of advertising in their kind of TV, TV and shop window advertising. They advertise complex bet types with high expected losses, and then within a bet type, they advertise representative sub-events within that complex bet type, um, which is kind of like two, uh, yeah, the two kind of behavioral insights um, that they seem to have learned somehow. Um, so if you like this talk, um, that's the reference to my paper where you can read more about it. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you very much in, 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 indeed, Phil. Um, really interesting stuff. I, I've certainly seen many of those and they are tempting, aren't they? I mean, because you kind of think Olivier Giroud, well, he, yeah, he's up front for the Arsenal. He might well score. So, bookies just... They're just doing what they do, aren't they? They're trying to sort of woo you to spend money on something and then, you know, try and steal it, basically. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that's, like, what their business is. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> well, in precisely. some way... And I'm, I, so I'm wondering, so you take your evidence. So we, we, we know what the bookies are up to. Thank you for, for explaining how, uh, how they're using, is it the dark, the dark nudge. Yeah. Um, how can we counter... I know you, you, you do a bit of gambling yourself, don't you? Um, I used to. Oh, um, right, okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm a reformed character reformed now. Reformed character. That's why right. I research it. So I maybe, maybe it that's the answer to the question. So <laughs> how, how can we, using, using your evidence, are you sort of basically saying only go for just a straight match winner bet? Or is it, or is it worth betting on Olivier Giroud at 9-1? to one? Um, Well, I'd say it's very much not worth it. I mean, to me, like, I'd only personally gamble if, like, the odds are in my favour. So, like, I would, <laughs> I would never take these bets that's on. That's not going to happen. Um, yeah, I mean, some people say, like, if it's what people want, then, like, you know, why don't you go for it? But, um, but like, you know, it's, it's quite clear that, you know, like, there are huge, just huge differences between the potential losses from different strategies. You know, like, expected losses going from, like, 5% to 40%. That's a huge difference. And also what the bookies have now is, like, kind of in-play betting. So now yeah. you're, when you're betting on Giroud to score the first goal, you're not just putting your bet on once a week. You're doing it throughout the football match, like during the whole 90 minutes, and you know you've got a different football match on every every day. So I mean, it's a vast difference between gambling that we have nowadays and the gambling type of gambling that we used to have, where you know people go down to the bookies like once a week, like they see their friends, like they put a bet on on the horses or whatever, and like in the worst case scenario, like they lose a few quid. 
nowadays it's very much like just the entire industry is just geared towards like getting people to bet more often and also to lose more per bet. So, I mean, I personally find that quite, quite worrying. Okay, uh, now, I'll take some questions. Anyone who's got any, any points that they want to, to make any questions? Um, my question is, what, what do you hope the bookies will do with this information? Um, I mean, yeah, it's, I'm, I, didn't, I very much didn't do the research for the bookies. I mean, <laughs> you know, we've got... Did you talk to them about it? I mean, I'm quite interested because and they've obviously got a very sophisticated machine behind all of this. They're, they're, for instance, the half-time odds thing that they'll put up, they've obviously assessed the first half. They're making judgments. They've presumably got... I mean, did you manage to talk to any of the bookies about how they, how they come to the odds at all? Uh, no, I mean, they don't share their data with researchers. So, I mean, that's why I had to, like, just observe kind of what I could. And I mean, like, I used, I used to live, like, in a part of South London that has, like, seven bookies all along the high street. And just going, like, on my way into uni each day, I'd see all the adverts and, like, just got interested in the patterns. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I d yeah, there is obviously, like, kind of a risk or whatever, of, you know, this stuff getting into the wrong hands. But... All of the bookies are already doing this, and they're all doing the same thing, and they're all kind of like going in this way already. So, like in terms of like, I think it's good to like just get the message out, and um, yeah, hopefully like enough kind of people with good intentions hear about it. Okay. Any other any other thoughts on the floor? Thank you. Um, have you thought about expanding those insights um, across other gambling domains? Because uh, Casinos, for instance, are masters of employing these kind of techniques. Uh, the best example is the roulette, uh, which typically shows you the, the previous rolls. So if there's been a lot of blacks, you'll, you're likely to bet on, on red, even though you know, there's no correlation between those two. Um, and, and I think it's an industry that's driven by these things, but it's not probably explained, and it's, it's not publicly debated at all. Mm -hmm. um, so. So have you considered like, expanding your research in the same uh, direction? Um, yeah, I mean, like, other people have kind of, like, probably done more, like, in casinos and things. Um, like, yeah, this kind of research was very much based on, like, um, what I'd seen that nobody else had done and also kind of, like, you know, in the environment that I was. Um, I mean, there are, like, you know, lots of things you could do, like, obviously, the fixed odds betting terminals inside bookies have got, like... Lots of tricks that they use as well. I mean, um, fixed odds betting terminals, though, are like kind of like more in the public consciousness. Like peop more people are aware that like these things are really bad. Uh, whereas like the in-play football betting and like the advertising that goes with it, um, it's not something that I've kind of like come across before. So that's kind of why this is what I chose to start off with. Um, but I'm very much looking to continue the research and kind of do some experiments. Um, I mean, the observational kind of research that I did, um, like. The thing is, like, it just really took it out of me, you know, like, I spent all of last summer, like, running around all these different bookies, like, you know, and, like, peop the people working in the shops would be like, oi, what are you doing, kind of thing, and I'd, like, run away, so, like, there's only... <laughs> this is the kind of research we like, this is what behavioural science is all about, actually. Yeah, yeah, punk rock behavioural <laughs> research. Um, yeah, I'm so quite interested. I like I like the idea of these dark nudges. I mean, you know, Richard Thaler famously said, you know, nudge for good. And I and, and I suppose that you know, bookies and advertisers generally are trying to alter people's behaviour using the same principles, but for profit or for yeah. their own personal gain. So so in a sense, what you're doing is applying behavioural science so that we can actually start seeing what seeing what they're up to in a way that we haven't before. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of showing like. Uh, behavioral science like in the field and one of the things that I find very fascinating about it is like I'm not sure how the bookies came up with the strategy or whatever but like I think it's relatively unlikely that you know they were working reading the collective works of Daniel Kahneman I think somehow you know they figured this stuff out on their own which is in one way is like a great replication for this kind of like behavioral research you know like we, there's been a lot about the replication crisis in psychology and this is showing like in real money context that the same effects are kind of dropping out um, so I find that really interesting. Okay. Um, any more questions? Yes. Sorry, Mike. Oh, lots of questions. I mean, this is great. Thanks. We I have was, to make this the last one, actually. Sorry, but you can ask after it. I was, I was wondering whether you observed any patterns in how the bookies compete between, between them. 
um, mm -hmm. whether they're trying to come up with uh, more elaborate and more complicated bets, or are they actually going uh, uh, or making it more fair to um, yeah. attract customers? Yeah, how does the market work? Uh, well, the thing is, they never want to advertise exactly the same bet because then you know people can just make the price comparison and choose. Um, so that and so they don't want to do the same thing, and yet they all want to like leverage the same effects. So they're always like kind of trying to like come out with like slightly new ways and slightly different things, but which is still leveraging like complexity and representativeness. So like sin, you know, I still like observe like these things going on, and some of the bookies have changed their like shop window advertising a little bit, like just different bet types or whatever. But it's still always complex bet types and then things that you can easily imagine happening. So within the constraints of like the biases of the mind. Um, they're kind of acting within those constraints, but then always trying to do something like slightly a little bit different, or but still doing the same thing. So. But your, the, the key message that comes across is, don't gamble. Is that basically it? Uh, yeah, that's, that's what it. I would uh, <laughs> say. To All right, thank you very much fun. indeed. Phil Neal, thanks very much indeed, Phil. Okay, uh, so um, our next, our next uh, uh, young uh, behavioral scientist is from Harvard, uh, Jana Gallus. Jana. Round of applause. Now, we all know Wikipedia, and we've probably all already found ourselves baffled by its success. It is the largest encyclopedia in history, history with more than 35 million articles in many different languages. And those articles are provided and constantly curated by millions of volunteers who are willing to contribute their time and effort to providing us with this public good. Notwithstanding <coughs> this tremendous success, Wikipedia faces a severe challenge looking into the future namely the retention of its editors, as this graph here illustrates. It shows the number of the declining number of active editors in the English language Wikipedia. And the authors from the study from which this graph is taken have identified in particular newcomer retention as a major source for this problem. And this is a challenge that not only online online communities, online, um, well, Wikipedia for that matter, face, but also organizations offline see themselves confronted with that challenge, in particular where organizations face a severe budget constraint, which limits them in their use of financial incentives to motivate people, but also where they rely on the work of individuals who are highly intrinsically motivated, such that the use of money would risk crowding out that important source of motivation. So in the, this context, where neither contracts nor economic in incentives, and in particular money, can be used, the question arises, which alternatives do we have to foster individuals' motivation? And as so often also here, a glance at history is quite revealing, this painting shows Napoleon Bonaparte when he first bestowed the now famous Légion d'honneur. It's an order, as we all know. And the quote underneath it illustrates quite nicely that he, as well as other rulers and people, award givers, before and after him, believed in that binding and loyalty-enhancing effect of awards. And I put up this um, quote in particular because I like it, the comparison that he draws here. He says that awards have a stronger loyalty-enhancing effect than chains of gold. And in nowadays terms, that would be money. That would be the equi equivalent. So it draws a comparison between awards and money, showing already that there is something to awards that makes it interesting to study awards as a separate phenomenon. Other characteristics that are important about awards is that awards can be given and based on broad performance criteria, so they do not require performance to be exactly defined ex ante and then measured ex post, which has a controlling aspect to it, which risks crowding out people's motivation if they feel being controlled. Awards can be based on broad performance, but encompassing performance evaluations. Also, awards are, as we all know, publicly celebrated, whereas money and employees and companies are often even forbidden to talk about the bonuses that they receive. So those are private matter. Money private awards are publicly celebrated. And lastly, awards are in most cases not taxed. So it doesn't come as a surprise that still today we observe that there are many different awards in many fields, but also in this um, 
field of volunteering or um, to honor outstanding in people's outstanding engagement. And we see that there's multiple organizations using awards, but also, as the examples on the right illustrate, heads of state who still make use of awards. When we observe this and this widespread use of, award, of awards, and in fact the fact that ever more awards seem to be um, used, a very important question that arises is whether those awards actually have an additional effect on their recipients' future performance and on their motivation, whether they do enhance those people's motivation or whether those awards are just given to the people who are already the top performers, who are already those who are most um, motivated. Merely observing that award recipients tend to outperform others in the future later on after receiving the award doesn't allow us to infer that the award had an additional effect on their performance. After all, that's what the award was meant to be given for, to the top performers. Given the widespread use of awards in society, it is quite surprising to see that the literature so far on awards is rather scarce. It has gained some traction recently, but in most cases we still study awards in an employment context, as you can see here, where firstly the award is announced as an ex-ante incentive, so it's very conditional. If you do X, you get the award, and also oftentimes in any, most Actually, all cases, we cannot exclude that those awards can still have a material or career-related benefit. So economists could still come and argue, well, if you find the award has a motivating effect, it's because it has a material advantage. So as an economist, it would be nice to illustrate and to show that awards, even if they are purely symbolic and about the honor, the honor that they confer have a motivating effect. Also, in many cases, we, are, we struggle with identifying causality in a nat natural field context because ideally we would want to randomize who gets the award to be able to make a causal inference. However, um, it is difficult to find an award board that would be willing to give us a free hand and randomize whom they are going to give the award to. So that is a major challenge. The study that is um, most Closely related to what I'm talking about here, to Wikipedia, public goods contributions, is a study that looked at medals that were promised for blood donations, and they looked at this medal, these medals as an ex-ante incentive, and they found that, yes, those medals have a motivating effect, but only if they are promised to, ma to be made public, if those individuals will come on stage, if they will be celebrated by their peers and their faces will appear in newsletters. So publicity is key. With Wikipedia, arguably, that publicity is much reduced because individuals operate under pseudonyms. And also, as I said, newcomer retention is the problem, so we want to see whether awards can be used to raise newcomer retention, and those individuals don't yet identify with that community in front of whom they will be celebrated. So to study that, that question and to find out whether in that context we can use awards to really tackle a real-world problem, I designed and implemented a large-scale field experiment with Wikipedia, and here, the close collaboration with Wikipedians, with long-term and established Wikipedians, was really key. They were willing to support that project, that award project, and also to serve as the official founding members of the award. So they gave me their reputation. They gave the award that reputation, of course, which is important because awards need to have a source of esteem if they are meant to be valuable. Also, that allowed me to create an award page that is then embedded in a national Wikipedia portal, which confers additional reputation to this award. So it's a meaningful award in that community. Another advantage is that the design, as you will see, allows me to closely ide identify, to cleanly identify causality. It allows me to study awards that are purely symbolic. They don't have any material or career-related benefit. The losers or the non-recipients are unaware of the, award, of, of the award's existence, so I'm not finding a loser's effect, but actually I'm just looking at the effect on the winners, whether it's motivating or not. And lastly, what is nice with Wikipedia is that I can observe all dimensions of activity, even the communication among editors. So every month I would extract the list of the previous month's newcomers and I applied some very basic and rules-based screening process to make sure that in the final sample I wouldn't have any vandals or firm accounts and from that final sample I randomly attributed the award to 150 individuals and the remaining um, individuals remained in my control group. And those individuals then who received the award got this award placed on their personal Wikipedia discussion page. So every user or editor, they are called users on Wikipedia, has a personal 
user page and like the flip side, a discussion page where this award was posted. Now, there are theories that would predict, and also empirical evidence, that even in such a context with, highly, with purely symbolic awards, we can find positive effects. Those individuals can start to self-identify with the community. It, it might trigger their status and reputation concerns. It's recognition that is motivating. And also, evaluation potential theory would predict that if individuals perceive their contributions to be identifiable and evaluated by others, that has, in and of itself, already a motivating effect. And will lead them to contribute. However, there are also reasons to expect that we could find no or even a negative effect. In that case of social identi identification, after all, those individuals are being classified as newcomers, so clearly on the lower end of a performance hierarchy. Then awards could be seen as just cheap talk or um, pieces of ribbon, and in that case, not even ribbon is in use. It's just a digital symbol. It's a highly community-specific asset um, because it's tied to the pseudonyms. It might signal to individuals that they've done enough. That's another reason why they could decrease their involvement afterwards. After all, that's a public good and they are apparently doing more than average. And that recognition could come, could be seen as premature and therefore have a demotivating effect. Lastly, if individuals um, perceive their contributions to be identified and evaluated, that could have also this controlling aspect again and crowd out their motivation. So what do we find? The analysis that I'll present now considers 11 award cohorts, so 11 months in which I bestowed that award, and we are dealing with a subject pool of more than 4,000 individuals. And now, coming to the most important slide of this talk, it, is, it shows you the result that I, re that I read from the analysis. It shows us that even such a purely symbolic award increases the rate of newcomers who remain active in the month following the award bestowal by 20%. And this is an effect that is not only statistically highly significant, it is also substantively significant. We can see that whereas the retention rate in the control group was 35%, it's seven percentage points higher in the treatment group among those who individuals who received the award. Now, in the next step, what I do, did then is ask whether this treatment effect, whether th this difference in the retention rate persists, which is ideally what we would like to find, right, even after that month already, although already a month is a long time horizon, or we, to at least make sure that it's not reversed, that the award does not have a sort of a crowding out effect because individuals come to expect these nice things to be forthcoming and once they are no longer forthcoming, they disproportionately discontinue their engagement. So I now also look at the treatment effect persistence at the difference in the retention rates in the four quarters following the initial award bestowal. And here we can see Q1, that's quarter one, we have a retention rate of 52% in the the treatment group only 47% in the control group and that difference of five percentage points is statistically significant that's what the stars are for the more stars the better and um, we see that um, the, that difference continues to be significant for the four quarters following the initial award bestowal and only then does it become insignificant but the difference still points into the expected direction coming back quickly to the different explanations um, whether those seem relevant um, I can now also, I collected data that would allow me to look at proxies that are being used in the literature on online communities to see whether self-identification with the community might be at play here. And those proxies really are variables that measure whether individuals are willing to engage in behind-the-scenes community coordination tasks that are being seen as tedious because you have to discuss on rules and so on. And looking at those variables, I do find that the award had a significant effect. Also, I draw on social signaling data to see whether status and reputation concerns seem to be at, at play, and that seems to be the case, or that is the case from what I can tell. And last, the, the next point, the success breeds success di dynamics, that's related to the status effect. So if I receive an award, Others from the community might be more forthcoming towards me or might also provide me with additional positive feedback that is triggered by this initial award and that could reinforce the initial award's effect and that's particularly relevant when we try to explain the treatment effect persistence. So this might also be due to additional feedback that was triggered by the award and then 
Um, I can also draw on anecdotal evidence that comes from the direct responses of award recipients that they posted under the award or on the awards page that suggests that recognition and the mere fact of getting attention by others seem to be highly motivating. So we see that even purely symbolic awards can have a highly motivating effect and help us in fostering the private provision, the voluntary provision of public goods such as Wikipedia. And this is the case where other incentives and in particular money fail we couldn't use money in that context, but it's also the case when those awards are highly community specific and when they are given to new newcomers, that those aren't even members of the community yet, they don't yet identify with that community, the awards seem to be pulling them in. And as you might guess, there are many interesting open questions that await future analysis, and I, that's what I want to end that is the, the, this talk with. For example, to look more closely at the different channels that seem to be at stake here to explain the motivating effect of awards, but also to find out which award designs work in what context and what the effect of different award designs is. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, I, I wanted just to ask you, though, you said early on in your talk, you know, you wanted to try and exclude the sort of financial advantage, but also career advantage, that people weren't... But I'm, a, I'm just thinking about the way awards work. And if you look at the British context, so we, we hand out gongs to lollipop ladies for doing, you know, volunteering and to captains of industry for being immensely rich um, or, and, and for to politicians' mates. But um, part of it actually is about, you know, the public recognition. It is something you can put on your CV. It does infer that you are a decent person. You know, you've been honoured by the state. And I'm, and I'm wondering whether in part what you've got here is, is with an online sort of Wikipedia award, something that somebody could say, look at me, I'm a, I'm a Wikipedia Edelweiss medal winner, um, and put it on you know, as somebody who is, is active and involved in this area. And is that such a bad thing? It would certainly not be a bad thing. However, for the purpose of this study, to really focus on the purely symbolic aspects of awards and to show that even if the award is purely symbolic, it has a motivating effect, even if there cannot be any material advantages forthcoming in the future, that is something that I wanted to focus on in this study. It would not be a problem if individuals used that award also for their CVs. But um, Wikipedians tend not to disclose their identity, so th those pseudonyms are kept like a secret. If you go to roundtable meetings, which I did very okay. often, you would interact with individuals and oftentimes you don't know that what their real world name is. And to, I have to say, the people who do go to roundtable meetings are rather rare. If we see the millions of Wikipedians, most of them never show up at a roundtable meeting. So the other thing about the way that UK awards is that we have basically a series of awards. You can be a, a, a member of the British Empire, you can be of an order, you can oh, be a... Com and so on, and CBE and various knighthoods in various guises. And so there is a sort of sense of you can get your, get your MBE, uh, but next time you get something a bit grander. And I was wondering, do you think maybe we ought to have sort of silver Edelweiss, golden Edelweiss, platinum Edelweiss, so you maintain the effect over a longer period? Yes, so there are such awards that can be forthcoming. In this award scheme, I focus on the first award, but there are also higher awards that oh, they, those individuals can, can receive. What's the top award? The three-star award, ah. but that's only after five months of, an, of um, activity, and then, it's discon then there's no award that's forth forthcoming anymore. But from what I can observe from the, the responses of the other Wikipedians, those responses already reinforce the initial awards effect. So they do get praise. There are such um, institutions as mentoring uh, relationships on Wikipedia, quite interestingly, okay. where an experienced editor would be the mentor for a less experienced or newcomer. And those mentors, as I can observe, they tend to also congratulate their mentees and be proud of them, as we all would if our mentee would receive an award, right? So right. they also, so that has an additional positive externality that it would be interesting to study as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Let's just take some questions from the floor. Yeah, gentlemen there. Yes, thank you. Once again, I find that also quite fascinating. But over the life of your study, there were hundreds of people who received rewards, who had these awards pasted on their pages and probably wrote something about how proud they were to receive this award and perhaps received emails and gave advice to others of what they might do 
and also to be able to receive an award, who now, with the publication of your paper, are going to discover those awards have been awarded <laughs> completely randomly. <No. laughs> If I may clarify, yeah. so this is not that this does not mean that I just picked the previous month's newcomers and randomly bestowed award. So there was, as I briefly mentioned, that rules-based screening process mm -hmm. to make sure that all those individuals that were in the final pool would be worthwhile, would deserve a newcomer award. This uh -huh. is, as I said, a newcomer award, which is a nice feature about this award because then you do not need to have the next Nobel laureate on Wikipedia and have that performance to give that award, but it's really a symbol of recognition. And also in the wording, we made sure that um, this is not, this is exactly what it is. It's, it's a token of recognition from the community for their So they would efforts. have deserved this anyway, yes. They the all of them would have deserved it. In the final, in the final sample, all yeah. of them would have deserved it. However, with awards, that's, that's a limitation. You cannot give, give the award to everybody. So an award, as Churchill, by the way, also said, <laughs> an award needs to be, remain scarce so as to um, continue to be valuable, to not have this inflationary mm. tendency. And so the treatment <coughs> had to be limited. And what better way to limit a treatment than to then decide um, on who will get the award from those individuals than randomly. Also, it prevents you from having any political interference that maybe in other cases might predict who gets some mm -hmm. award and who does not get the award. Okay, thank so. you for that. I was a little bit concerned that they might yeah, yeah. be okay. totally pissed and then quit, no, no, no. <laughs> quit also, Wikipedia as a result. I, and, no, no. And also I should point out that after that study, I continued to give out this award for a long time because I'd shown that it has a significant and an important effect on newcomer retention, which is really, you might have read about this in The Economist and other newspapers, it's really a key issue that Wikipedia is struggling with newcomer retention. And since I showed that this award has, or this, since this study was able to show that th this award program has a significant effect, I then decided to also give the award for months without testing anything. And also there, I didn't randomize it anymore because that whole rules-based screening process took a considerable time. And the whole thing was rather time consuming. Yeah. So you then- realize, You realize you're stuck with this forever now. You are <laughs> going to be uh, Miss Edelweiss for, for the rest of the rest of time. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of, yeah. we have run yeah, out no. of time, but thank you very much indeed, Jan and Gallus. Thanks very very much. <laughs> okay, we have uh, uh, two more uh, people to go. Our third um, uh, representative is from Washington University. Uh, please put your hands together for Heng Chen Dai. Heng Chen. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to uh, be one representative of the behavioral scientists of the future. So, uh, we should travel fast, future. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how resetting performance metrics can affect individuals' future performance. This is an ongoing research project. I'm very excited to share with you what I have found so far, but I definitely welcome your suggestions and feedback. So imagine that you are a manager in a sales company. When it comes to give feedback and the performance appraisals, you may choose to track employees' cumulative sales each month, and at the beginning of the next month, you are going to reset their monthly sales totals to zero and track from beginning again. Imagine that after you hear Yana's talk, you decide that next month you are going to launch an award program and you are going to award the employee with the best uh, attendance record only starting from next month. And then what you are saying is you are implicitly disregarding employees' uh, attendance records in the past. So these are just the two examples of what I call performance resets. Those are situations when individuals past the performance records, either sales performance records or attendance records, are temporarily or permanently uh, wiped clean such that it is no longer relevant to individuals' future performance appraisals. And I'm interested in how performance resets can affect individuals' subsequent motivation and performance. And what determines whether people would respond by redoubling their effort or relaxing their effort? I propose that one answer to this question depends on, well, it depends on people's past performance. When individuals' past performance was weak, having a clean slate have a fresh start means that people have a new opportunity to prove themselves. It means that my past failures may no longer be indicative of what I can do in the future. And this can excite people, make them exert more effort, and help improve performance. On the other hand, 
when individuals' past performance was strong, having a clean slate may suggest that people have to start building their uh, strong record all over again from a blank slate, and which could be unappealing and may disengage and discourage individuals, which further harm future performance. So I have begun to test the relationship between past performance, performance reset, and future performance. And today I'm going to show you three studies, one in the field and two in the lab. In a field study, I looked at the effects of performance resets among professional baseball players. The major league baseball in the United States consists <coughs> of two major leagues, the National League and the American League. When players are traded across leagues in the middle of the season, some of their season-to-date statistics are reset. For example, their batting average statistics are reset in order to later on determine whether players are qualified for the batting average title in their new league. Okay. Players can also be traded to a different team within the same league. In this case, their season-to-date statistics are not reset. So I'm going to look at how performance reset induced by a cross-league trade can affect players' subsequent performance differently uh, depending on their performance prior to being traded. And I'm going to use within league trade as the control group because this allows me to tease apart effects of reset from the basic effects of being traded at all or the effects <coughs> of regression to the mean. So I focus on batting performance of players. I identified the 706 trades that happened from 1975 to 2014 in the middle of a regular season, that is, before the playoff season started. 42% of those trades were across league trades, and I have confirmed that across league trades and within league trades were comparable in many important dimensions that I care about, such as players' pre trade performance and team's performance. And there were more than 250,000 observations that tracking what happened each time when a player was at bat. So it's at bat level. I saw the mic, I was like, wow, so many observations. Yeah. Um, the primary measure of performance was hit. It's an indicator of whether or not a given player uh, hit the ball successfully each time when he was at bat. And consistently, I measure past performance by tracking individuals' uh, pre trade batting average. That is, the number of times when this player uh, hit the ball divided by the total number of times this player uh, was at bat in the season prior to being traded. Okay, so this is my measure of past performance. I'm going to show you the results, the essence of my results in a graph, but I'm happy to talk to anyone who is excited about regression analysis and the statistics test. And here in this graph, I'm showing you the average probability of hitting at a bat during the 90-day period prior to being traded and 90-day period post the trade. And I separated the time window into three 30-day intervals in order to show you the time trend. I categorized players along two dimensions. The first dimension was whether the player was involved in a waiting league trade, in which case there was no reset, or an across league trade with a reset. The second dimension was the player's pre-trade batting average. And for illustration purposes, this graph only focused on two types of players whose pre-trade batting average was one standard deviation below the mean or lower, or very well, one standard deviation above the mean or higher. So now let's first look at players who did not perform well prior to being treated and subsequently experienced and within the trade. As indicated by this solid line, those players on average improve their performance. This is not surprising. It could be regression to the mean, it could be uh, simply being treated, have a new environment or more practice later. But what I care about is the difference between a waiting league trade and a cross league trade happen uh, on those low performers. So keep your eye on the start in the line. Before traded, low performers who were traded across the league later uh, had no difference in their behavioral pattern compared with low performers who were later traded within league. Um, however, after being traded across the trades, these two significant uh, benefits over and beyond within the trades. And this is consistent with my basic hypothesis that when you did not perform well, having a reset in this case potentially induced by a cross the trade uh, could lead to performance benefits. However, for high performers, first we see that if they are simply traded within a league, um, their performance decreased a bit after they were traded. <coughs> Uh, in this case, a cross league trade did not help high performers, but instead, directionally speaking, uh, a cross league trade made high performers worse off relative to winning league trades. So, this study.
study provides initial correlational evidence that uh, the effects of performance resets on future performance depends on how people perform in the past. In order to test the causal effect of uh, having a reset, I would like to move to a lab setting where I experimentally manipulated whether or not people had a reset in the middle of the task. I invited participants online and they worked on uh, 10 bubble games. For each game, they had a different board consisted of nine letters. <coughs> Their task was to generate words using more than three letters, at least three letters under certain rules. They were paid based on their performance, so they had an incentive to optimize their performance. Participants received feedback on their performance after each game. So it's game by game, real feedback. For example, this is example after game five, participants would see their own score for each game, their average score on all games so far. Sorry, I apologize if the font is a bit small. Um, and also they saw a horizontal, horizontal line that indicated um, the average score of previous participants. And then after game five, I randomly assigned participants into one of two conditions, the control condition or the reset condition. In the control condition, nothing happened, nothing changed in terms of how I provide feedback. Participants still see uh, their, uh, each, their, the score for each game from game six to game 10, as well as their average score, which was tracked from game one to game 10. However, for those in the reset condition, they had a clean slate. Their performance on the first five games was set in stone, and they started a new round, round two. The last five games were now labeled as round, uh, games one to five of a new round. And more importantly, people see that their average score on round two was from zero. It's a new starting point to reset. So it's a very subtle reset manipulation. Financial incentives were not changed. It's simply how it presents information and gives feedback. So let me show you the results again in a graph uh, where I look at the change in performance between the first and last five games. A positive value indicates a performance improvement. And for illustration purposes, I separate people into two groups based on whether their performance on the first five games was either below the median or above the median in order to qualify whether they're low performer or high performer. So first, let's look at those people in the control condition who did not experience um, a reset. For those people on average, they improve their performance between the first five games and last five games. So it could be it's learning effect, they just get more familiar with the task. Interestingly, for those people who did not perform well at first during the first five games, uh, they experienced the additional benefit, this is a marginally significant, uh, adi additional benefits from having a reset relative to having just a control. And importantly, for those people who perform well during the first half of the uh, the task during the first five games, they actually did not ex experience performance improvement after reset. So as a result, reset made them worse off relative to the control. If you look at the next, uh, the right two parts there. And my regression analysis confirmed that the effect of having a reset on subsequent performance depends significantly on how people performed at first. Well, so the first two studies are very intriguing. Um, but they, uh, in those two cases, the high performer versus low performer is not randomly assigned, so there could be self-selection, heterogeneity issue in terms of how people respond to a new opportunity. So in the last study, I experimentally manipulated people's perceptions of their past performance. So participants, again, were recruited online, and then play, they played 10 snake games. I want to show you how the game works. <coughs> So at the beginning of the game, uh, they click on the black square, uh, they move the uh, white square or the snake around in order to eat the red dot to gain more points. And if the snake clashes into the wall, the game ends. I don't want to admit how much time I spent when I was a kid on the snake game on a black and a white Nokia phone um, a number of years ago. But participants seem to enjoy it. And I give participants feedback uh, game by game, again, uh, in a very similar format as in the previous study. And then I randomly assigned them to different conditions after game five. There were two experimental manipulations. The first experiment manipulation was designed to make people feel either bad or good about their performance during the first five games. I'm going to talk about this manipulation in a moment. The second manipulation was a reset versus control manipulation. Again, I used a very similar manipulation as in the previous study by changing how I give people feedback, give them a new start. Okay, to vary people's perceptions of their performance during the first five games, I selectively presented them information about previous participants' scores. In a low self-assessment condition, 
I presented scores from 20 previous players who uh, did very well, and that's meant to make people feel relatively ba uh, bad about their own performance. In a high self-assessment condition, in comparison, I give participants information about 20 previous players who uh, did poorly. In contrast, this is supposed to make people feel relatively good about their own performance, and indeed, my manipulation was successful in terms of changing people's perceptions. And here, I'm looking at the change in people's performance between the first and last five games. So let's first look at those people in the low self-assessment condition who were led to believe that uh, they did not perform well at the first. So unfortunately, in this study, uh, I only find directional but not statistically significant uh, difference between the risk and the control condition in terms of benefiting the people. I would definitely love to explore this phenomenon more in my subsequent studies. However, look at those people in a high self-assessment condition who are led to believe that they did very well at the beginning, they were significantly hurt by having a reset compared with just having a control without reset. So again, this confirmed my hypothesis that the effect of a reset depends on not just people's past performance, but also their perceptions of their past performance. So based on the three studies I've conducted so far, I found evidence that resetting performance records may improve performance when people previously performed poorly, but may hurt performance when individuals performed well or believe that they performed well. And managers may be able to boost the morale of low performers by giving them a reset, encouraging them to have a new start, but managers may also want to be aware that negative uh, effect on high performers, potentially when they're going to launch a project that may unintentionally induce a reset. Also, for policymakers, um, this research, as well as some other research I've been doing, I'm happy to talk about offline, suggests that they may want to uh, leverage first starts to help people avoid what the hell rationalization that I already talked about <coughs> earlier today and help people avoid slippery slopes <coughs> and engage in self improvement efforts. And also, we want to be aware that one intervention may not fit all, what help uh, uh, one group of people may actually backfire on uh, other groups. So, with that, I would like to thank. Um, anyone who has contributed to this project helped me along the way and thanks for having me back Okay, here's my, here's my problem. So I'm, I'm a manager mm -hmm. and I've got all my staff there and some of them I want to reset their performance and some of them I don't. The trouble is they talk to each other. So the ones who've had their performance reset know that they were clearly duffers in the previous thing. Mm -hmm. And actually you could, you could the, uh, the experiment could, uh, could sort of unravel because people start realizing which category they've been put in, no? Mm, I think that is a common problem with any type of intervention organization. There is social contamination, inform information will flow from one group to the other. It's definitely important to think about how to address the procedure justice issue and mm. let people uh, realize that. Have you just in the canteen? Have you had your, uh, you know, yeah. have your targets reset exactly. or not? Mm -hmm. And the other thing I wanted to ask you was, because um, it's such a beautiful way of doing it, the baseball idea. How did you come up with that? Was there a kind of moment? Were you watching baseball? How did that happen? You think, oh, that's it! Well, yeah, that, this actually speaks to why it is important to have collaboration. So this is the first project I'm working on by myself, which constantly reminds me how, <coughs> how fine it is to have collaboration. It's based on uh, idea generation process. I had a friend who reminded me of this uh, aha moment of uh, baseball. It's definitely not my own insights during okay. a discussion. Somebody else had the aha moment, did they? Yeah, yeah. so I think, um, so it's, it's more about when we discuss, okay, what can we study in baseball? We know that there is a reason at the beginning of the season, but that one is not an interesting in the sense everyone have a reset. There is no real control condition. Yeah, yeah and then discussion and realized, and then okay, said, actually, so actually, across the, the season, trade, season, that is the real between reset. Between the leagues, I thought that was, yes, that was yes. really beautiful. So I definitely would, would thank uh, my friends who okay. suggest that interesting well, we'll, 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 we'll thank them privately. Um, brilliant. Who's got a question? Yes, from there. Thank you. Uh, fascinating. So people are motivated by the chance to, you know, do better than they did last. Um, have you thought about how this affects uh, the middle performers? So you could theorize that if there's a reset, then people who did just average, they would kind of perform better than if there's no reset, uh, because now they have the chance to to do well. So you don't you don't have the pri you don't just have the, the primary effect on the people who did well or, behave, or poorly, but you, you actually have a team, kind of an implication for the, the entire team's performance, perhaps, or at least that's, that, that could be a plausible question. 
Yeah, that's an interesting point. So here, uh, for illustration purposes, I categorize people as a low and a high performer. But uh, in my actual study, as well as my conceptualization, I consider it as a continuum stream. Sorry, continuum um, line such that this is lo very low performer and middle performer, high performer. It is only in terms of the extent to which you will benefit from a reset that would differ. Uh, based on your past performance. There is no simply, simply categorization of low and high, and people in the middle could still benefit from a reset for sure. And in baseball study, I don't find a main effect of uh, switching uh, to a different league, which actually is confirmed by previous research. So it seems like on average, there is not a positive effect, but depending on whether you did well or not, there is an effect. Okay, another question? Okay. Looks like you've, 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 you've solved it all. That was a, that was a fantastic presentation and uh, very well done. Thank you very much, Du Tang Ching Dai. Okay, time now for the last of our four presentations uh, from the uh, University of British Columbia. It's Ashley Williams. Ashley. Hi everyone, thanks so much um, for sticking it out to this point in the conference. Um, I'm going to be talking about some research that's looking at the relationship between time, money, and happiness. So I have some bad news. If there's some of you in the audience that think that money can't buy happiness, you may need to reframe your thinking. Um, so over the course of the talk today, I want to share some insights that may suggest that if you think money can't buy happiness, and in particular the research I'm going to be sharing today, time, you may not be spending your money correctly. So we know from previous research that there isn't a linear relationship between income and happiness. So it seems that the relationship between money and the extent to which you experience positive emotions in your everyday life seems to kind of flatline somewhere around $75,000. Depends on, you know, who you ask and what study you read. Um, but, but the basic idea is that after some point in time, having more money does not necessarily translate into greater well-being. So this leads to the question, if having more money doesn't necessarily translate into greater happiness, when can money translate into greater happiness? What can we do to help leverage the happiness benefits of money? So this, uh, I see Liz in the audience. Um, Liz and Mike have a couple of principles that I've been conducting some research on during the course of my dissertation. One of them that I spent a great deal of time exploring is this idea that we can use money to <coughs> spend on others. But what I'm going to be sharing today is how some really new research um, that I've been exploring as part of my dissertation, looking at how we might be able to use money to change the way we spend our time. So why should we even explore this question in the first place? All of us have 24 hours in a day. We all have lots of time, right? Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. Nationally representative survey data suggests that 80% of Americans report wishing they had more time to spend with their friends and family. And in this same sample, a majority of respondents feel that there's just simply too much to do, that they can't balance the demands of work and life. I can relate to feeling like my to-do list always feels like this image over here. However, with the rise of uh, modern technology, such as the sharing economy, we can use um, money to change the way we spend our time. So here, this person is trying to multitask, uh, taking care of both of his child and perhaps his finances. <laughs> but recent research suggests, um, or sorry, uh, the sharing economy, such as um, uh, such as uh, companies, such as TaskRabbit, are allowing us to change the way that we spend our time by using money to outsource tasks that we dislike, allowing us to spend more meaningful and purposeful time with the people we care about. So maybe now he's spent a little bit of money to get help with his finances, so now this father can actually dote on his children and enjoy some meaningful seconds together. Um, indeed, as I said before, the sharing economy makes it relatively easy um, to outsource our everyday tasks, such as our cleaning, even our gift wrapping, um, by connecting people, oops, sorry, by connecting people who want to do these tasks for some fee with the people who need these tasks desperately done. 
So what we wanted to explore was a relationship first between using money to change the way we spend our time and happiness. But it is worth noting before I dive into my data that we don't wanna, I'm not suggesting that we should outsource tasks that we genuinely enjoy. So if you're anything like my husband, yes, I'm very lucky, um, who greatly enjoys doing the dishes, I'm not suggesting that you should use money to outsource doing the dishes or doing laundry if that's something that you generally really enjoy doing. Um, but rather, we should think about using money to shave away those minutes that we absolutely dread out of our day. So across the studies I'm going to show now, looking at the relationship between using money to change the way we spend our time by outsourcing our disliked tasks to others, we define what we mean um, in terms of our tasks. So we ask people, did you spend money to outsource any tasks that you absolutely dislike doing? Of course, we don't want to take pleasurable moments from your day if you enjoy the laundry. So what we did is we asked survey respondents whether or not they use money um, to change the way they spend their time by outsourcing their dislike tasks to others. And we also asked them about their happiness. And what we find across the, uh, several studies that we've run so far is that people who use money to change the way they spend their time by outsourcing report experiencing greater happiness, greater social connection, and greater meaning in life. And that this holds controlling for other covariates that are really important um, for happiness, such as marital status, how much money people make, gender, and age. So we wanted to, in addition to just looking at the relationship between outsourcing and happiness, we wanted to look at whether or not there were some boundary conditions of this effect. So we examined some data from the American Time Use Survey, which asks people what they've done in the last 24 hours, and also asks them about their, their emotional experiences, how happy they felt over the last 24 hours. And in the American Time Use Survey, this survey also asked people how many minutes they spent in the last 24 hours, in our case, using money to outsource tasks to others. And what we found in this data set was, again, a small but significant relationship between using money to change the way we spend our time and happiness, um, but that this was only true on the weekends. So people only derived the emotional benefits of outsourcing when they did so on the weekends, and that this was driven in part by the fact that people who outsource on the weekends also spent more time with their friends and family. So it seems that we might not, I might not want to be suggesting that we should, you know, um, use money to change the way, to use money to outsource our tasks in the absence of also using that time that we've saved by outsourcing in better ways, such as connecting with our friends and family. And so doing so on the weekend allows you to enjoy that free time that you've just bought yourself. So across a variety of studies we've run so far, we find that using money to change the way we use our time, such as by outsourcing, is associated with greater happiness, happier weekends, and having more social time. But across all of our studies, we find that only about 17% of our samples report using money to buy time. So why is this? Why do people not really recognize the potential benefits of using the money in our wallets to change the way we spend our time on a daily basis? What are some of these barriers that people might be facing? So in addition to some practical barriers, um, such as maybe not knowing that these outsourcing services exist, um, there might be some other reasons why people do not use money to buy time. So first, people might not be able to readily envision what they would outsource. So maybe people just enjoy all of the tasks that they have to do on an everyday basis, and they can't really think of anything in their lives that is taking up moments that they could be spending doing something else. Um, so to um, get at this question, we asked a nationally representative sample of Americans, if you could outsource one task that you dread doing, what would it be? Um, and 99.1% of our respondents said they could definitely think of something that they would like to outsource. Cleaning and household maintenance and shopping were up at the top of our list. Uh, there was a few respondents that said they would like to outsource spending time with their uh, significant others. Um, this wasn't a longitudinal data set, so I'm you know, not so sure about uh, how, how those relationships are going. Um, but nonetheless, what we can see here is that the majority of individuals in this nationally representative sample can definitely think of something that they would want to outsource. So it doesn't seem to be the problem that people just can't simply generate something that they would really like to spend their money getting rid of doing. So maybe another barrier is that people just don't expect to save enjoyable time. Sure, I can ask someone to do the laundry, but maybe I'll just spend that couple of hours working. 
to get at this question, we asked our nationally representative sample of Americans, so if you could outsource that one task that you really don't like, what would you spend this time doing? Most people said relaxing, hobbies, a few people said working, but the majority, nothing was also a common response, um, but the majority of these responses are enjoyable activities. People tend to be able to think of things that they would rather spend their time doing than the dishes for laundry. So this doesn't solve our problem. We see that 99% of our sample can easily think of something that they would like to outsource, but only 17% of the participants in our samples tend to do this. So maybe there's some other psychological factors at play. So one idea in the behavioral sciences literature is this idea of future time slack. Now this is kind of jargony sounding, but once I explain it to you, you'll be like, yes, I absolutely do that and I, I know the feeling. So this is the idea that the, in the present moment, on a day-to-day -day basis, we really recognize how busy we are. It's really easy to think of all of the meetings that we have to attend and all of the things in our to-do list when we're thinking about today. However, when we're projecting into the future, the future feels gloriously empty. The agendas of our future look like this blank slate. So this is the idea that people think that they'll have more time in the future than they do in the present moment. This is otherwise known as the yes damn effect, as in, yes, I'll absolutely do that, and then when you actually, the future comes and you said you were gonna do something, you have a million other deadlines, so hence the yes, damn effect. Um, so what, what maybe would help individuals use money to change the way they spend their time is by making their future time feel more similar to the very busy present. So taking the future and making it feel a little bit more similar to the present. So to explore whether or not in helping individuals project into the future a little bit more accurately, we conducted a naturalistic field experiment with a major company that's part of the sharing economy, TaskRabbit. So this is sort of one of these companies that I was talking about before that connects taskers who are interested in doing tasks with people who need help with some of the errands in their everyday lives. So we randomly assigned um, uh, participants off the mailing list, so there was 80,000 participants in our naturalistic field experiment, to one of three conditions. So there was a couple of control conditions that simply mention that maybe by using TaskRabbit you could have more free time, or by using TaskRabbit you could have more free time to spend with friends and family. But in our experimental condition, we asked people if they wanted a specific amount of time exactly one week in the future. So we sent out this email mid-morning, busy Thursday morning, and we asked people in the subject line to think if they would like to have more time one week in the future. So by making that date concrete, we can really help people think they're sitting at their desk, they're saying, oh, I could really go for two more hours this morning, um, and it's a Thursday. And so by, by helping, by kind of making this link for people, it might encourage them to be more willing to use an outsourcing service. Um, so we had two DVs in the study, both whether or not people clicked on the email and read it, and also whether they clicked this link, which took them to the TaskRabbit website where they could sign up for some services. And what we find, so this blue bar here is our experimental condition. So compared to our other two um, control conditions, what we find in the highest bar is the open rates. We find that just by reminding people that they could save two hours on one day, exactly one week in the future, that this increased open uh, hit rates uh, to the email by about 7% and open rates by about 4%, um, which I, according to um, the team at TaskRabbit was some very promising and exciting results. So it seems that by helping people realize they'll be probably just as busy in the future as they are in the current moment, that we can encourage individuals to use money to change the way um, they'll spend their time in the future. But of course, there, um, so, but of course there are uh, many ways in which we can use money to save time. So we can take a direct flight instead of many connections. Um, we can buy a cheaper, or uh, sorry, we can buy an apartment that's closer to our place of employment versus a house in the suburbs that is further away from our place of employment, um, and therefore the condo might be a little bit more expensive, but will save us some time every day. So maybe there are people walking around the world that have a proclivity to choose time over money, and maybe this also relates more broadly to well-being. So to explore this question, 
we asked also a nationally representative sample of Americans whether or not they were more like Tina or more like Maggie. So these were gender balanced, but this is just an example. So we asked people whether or not they valued their time over their money and were willing to sacrifice money to have more time, or whether or not they were like Maggie and valued money more than time, so that they were willing to sacrifice time to have more money. And what we found in this uh, data was that individuals who said they were like Tina, so they said they were more likely to value their time over money, were happier in this nationally representative sample, and were also more likely to volunteer and were more politically engaged, suggesting more broadly um, that placing a premium on time over money might not only be good in terms of helping us spend better time in the moment, but for our overall well-being, and even in terms of encouraging pro-social um, and political engagement. So some future directions of this project are what we might be able to do at an organizational level to encourage people to start thinking about having more time as opposed to having more money. So one exciting direction of this work that um, we're currently in the midst of making happen is a collaboration with the social and behavioral sciences team at the White House. Um, they're looking to us um, to conduct some experiments looking at the effect of time versus monetary incentives, so rewarding employees with additional flex time versus cash bonuses, and looking not only at the effect on job satisfaction, stress, and performance, but also potentially looking at the way that such organizational practices might fundamentally shape the way people think about time and money with downstream implications for the organizational environments of these different offices. So to some, I want to say that at least tentatively, some of the research I've conducted so far as part of my dissertation suggests that to promote happiness, you might want to use your money to change the way that you spend your time. So I want to say thank you. <laughs> So that's thanks to my collaborators. Thanks for Great, we've got a question. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Now, um, I'm, I'm intrigued, intrigued by this. So if, if I was above $75,000 a year, whatever the number might be, let's, let's imagine I earn $750,000 a year, and I've got a private jet, and I don't have to worry about going, spending all that time in line and doing all that business at the airport. And actually, I've got a cleaner, and I've got a gardener, and I've got somebody else. And frankly, I don't even have to work anymore. I can just you know, go and spend as much time. Mm. So why am I not brimmingly happy? Why am I not getting any happier if it's as simple as that? So if you... So I'm using, you know, I'm very rich. I'm, I'm spending my money on all this. I don't have to worry about How the washing How much are you working? Up, even though, well, I'm, I'm working quite hard, but frankly, I'm so rich, I don't really have to worry about that. I, you know, I can, I, can, uh, I can hang around at home and watch baseball if I want. Well, then maybe I would suggest that you should turn to some of Liz and Mike and I's other research and look at how you might be spending money uh, too much on yourself and not enough on others. Brilliant, brilliant yeah. answer. Um, I do remember some work, and I can't remember, was it Ed Steiner or someone who did the small triangles work? Do you remember this stuff? So this was uh, related to well-being. Life is a small triangle, okay? So this is, um, what you don't want to be is a long, thin triangle. And the triangle is made up of home, work, shops. And what you want is the smallest triangle you can get. And they did some wonderful, you should look it up anyway. It's a um, lovely presentation. Let's take some questions uh, from, oh, lots of questions. That's great. No, no, uh, lady there. Yeah. Linking your research with the um, comments yesterday in the um, plenary session about how um, poverty um, means that people spend all their time thinking and focusing about money. Mm -hmm. Does this imply that there's a moral imperative on policymakers to narrow the gap between wealthy and poor and ensure the minimum number of people are in poverty so that they can then maximise their opportunity to be happy? Mm. It's a curveball question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to make sure that I'm clear on your question. So you want to know how these findings link to potentially reducing the poverty gap, and whether or not these findings can shed light on why policymakers would want to... Re so I just want to be clear that my findings, although they could potentially have policy applications, have not been tested in this particular setting. So I'm looking at individual decision making in this context. Um, um, when you said about, um, sorry, the time versus money, the people who spend their time mm -hmm. thinking about money are less happy than the people who spend their time, their money, 
So in other words, time. people who are poor and worry about money more are going to be more unhappy. They can't, they can't be as happy as people who don't have to worry about money and therefore narrowing the poverty gap should improve overall well-being. Is, is that, because is that people will be focusing less on having money over time. So in, in our findings, what we find is that, um, yes, yeah, so wealthier people are more likely to value time over money, sort of suggesting that it's perhaps they don't have to worry about making money as much. So very tentatively, those findings and the way that you're kind of talking about them could provide suggestive evidence um, for this idea that basically, yes, narrowing the poverty gap as opposed to maybe so that people aren't ruminating thinking about money and can move um, what they're thinking about to more, um, to different kinds of pursuits such as having more time or connecting and, and that kind of thing as opposed to, you know, really ruminating and think, Elder Shafir's work, ruminating, thinking about money um, could have downstream consequences for well-being. Yeah. And yeah. I saw another hand over there. Uh, my question is sort of related. I wonder if there mm -hmm. are any other findings between income levels, because we're building on and working on um, continuing Eldar's work. And one of the things we're thinking about is creating slack for people and whether you create that in totally unconstrained dollars or whether you might give them choice about replacing things for them that are hassles or time consuming. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious if you had any kind of breakdowns by income. So looking at the relative benefit of outsourcing on happiness by income level. So across these studies, we don't actually find evidence for an interaction. Um, but as you're, I think the idea that you're talking about is, is interesting in the sense that maybe instead of, for some people, instead of giving them more money, it might be more beneficial to replace, to give people more time slack. So there could be this kind of, once you get to a certain point in terms of having enough slack in your budget, to kind of use Elder Shafir's terms, that once you have enough slack in your wallet, your financial, um, you know, you know, you you have enough um, financial slack that you then to in continue to increase well-being. It might be worthwhile to start looking at all other ways, such as increasing people's time slack. So you, instead of giving people more money, giving people more time, such as through these different services. It's interesting. In the, in the 50s and 60s, we were sold this idea that we were going to live in an age of of leisure. You know, that washing machines were going to take the drudgery out of laundry and that hoovers were going to stop us having to sweep the house every day. And actually, the reverse happened. We didn't find we had more leisure time. We worked harder than ever. So we really do get it horribly wrong, don't we? Well, I, I wouldn't go as far as that. So I think we have a, it, a little bit wrong in the sense maybe we work too much and, and prioritize making money too much. But in some of my data, I actually find a quadratic effect. So if you out, spend too much money outsourcing, that's also bad for happiness. So we, we want a happy medium where we feel like exact, maybe the triangle thing can come back here. We can, we can, find, some, <laughs> we can find some balance um, between work that feels meaningful, but also that we feel like we have enough time also um, to spend time doing things that make us happy, such as spending time with our friends and family and, and being I, in places like this. I'm afraid I'm going to have to borrow your husband to come over and do the washing up there. Thank <laughs> you very much indeed, Ashley Willis. Thank Thanks very much <laughs> to all four. Okay, uh, well you've heard, I think, four very different, but actually all completely fascinating uh, presentations and the unenviable task of trying to pull that together and, uh, and provide some sort of uh, overall insight into what we've just been heard uh, falls to our next guest, Michael Sanders, who is uh, Head of Research at BIT. Michael, please come up. So, yeah, I do feel slightly overawed by the task of pulling together four things and so I'm going to fail miserably. I also am conscious that I've stood up with three minutes to speak and I've already wasted 15 seconds of it explaining how hard it is to do things in this kind of time frame. So I'm just going to massively overrun and you guys can just leave. Um, so one of the things I thought which has always concerned me about Ashley um, is that she doesn't really seem to practice what she preaches because we asked her for her a copy of her paper so I could try and read it in advance of this of this talk and it came out within, within 15 minutes while she was on her honeymoon. And so really I, th I had thought that she was doing, she was doing it all wrong and was wasted, was spending her time suboptimally. But now what I've realized from her talk is that I am one of the unpleasant tasks. She's outsourced to task <laughs> or something. Um, so the, the research that's been presented is really fascinating. And it's done the two things which I think if you told me prior to reading the papers that they could be done, I would have said were completely impossible. One is trying to get Wikipedia to run a, f a field experiment because like trying to gain access to a basically by design, secretive, a bunch of people who don't meet up with each other and are all use pseudonyms and convincing them to randomize anything from the outside. If you asked me to do it, I would just say no thanks and I'm 
I'm going to quit the field. Um, so that was, I think that was, was particularly spectacular. The other thing is making baseball even very slightly interesting. <laughs> um, um, so that, that was, a, again, a, a truly monumental feat. Um, so when I, was, when I was coming up, during my PhD, I would go to a series of seminars of people describing how bad the world is. So I had a great many PhD colleagues who were telling, me, telling us that social mobility was going down and everything, we were all going to ruin, the banks were going to destroy the world, and that we were going to flood, so we were all going to be poor and destitute and underwater, which would be even worse than being poor and destitute and above water, I'd imagine. Um, and that was sort of the feeling of most of the pe people who I knew who were doing PhDs was everything was bad and it was going to get worse over time, but it was very descriptive. Um, so what I really liked is having a series of papers sort of describe, not to say this is what the problems are in the world, but give us real substantive things which we can do to try and improve the world and make it better, which obviously uh, BIT is what we do, what we're supposed to be trying to do uh, every day. So that's sort of where you go. It's like not just knowing uh, that... Uh, Extrinsic uh, rewards crowd out intrinsic motivation is really fascinating, but actually what's next is how do we fix that problem? Not just saying that motivating people in the workplace is really hard because some people are motivated by one thing and some people are motivated by another. Saying actually, yes, here's, what, here's the lines on which this happens and here's how you divide it. And so that's, again, real like, substantive policy impact. That doesn't look at the mean effect, but looks at dividing people into different types of things based on their prior characteristics, which certainly in a lot of our work at BIT, if we're being entirely honest, is something we've been less good at in the past, but I hope we're moving into a space. I'm now going to end on the low note, which is that while things are looking up and there are positive interventions, there are this, these dark nudges out there, um, and so the, the evil people are coming to get us. And so this is a time when it's in very important still to have descriptive work and to be able to say that like, there are people who are using these things for what can only really be described as, as evil and that we need to be mindful of this. And that as policymakers, and uh, there's been a session today on regulation as well, like, this is something which we really need to be mindful of, not just how can we use uh, behavioral insights in policy making, but how can we also think about how do we regulate the use of behavioral insights by potentially other organizations that may not have the best interests of people at heart. So I think there's really fascinating pieces of research as with any sort of smorgasbord of stuff, you're going to get some stuff that makes you feel, yes, I'm really positive about the world, and some stuff that makes you feel like, oh, God, we're all going to die. Um, and to be honest, I feel like the, oh, God, we're all going to die is a really great call to action for us all. Like, the work isn't done. There's still so much to do, and I feel very relieved that we have such excellent people in the future of behavioral science to make sure that people like me can die happy in a few years. <laughs> Thank you. You, you took the words out of my mouth. It's been an excellent session, I hope you all agree, and, and also a very inspiring and optimistic session for, for behavioural science going forward. So c congratulations and well done to our, to our four uh, behavioural scientists and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much indeed.